Hello friends, it's Steve from Southern Illinois and we managed to keep the weather almost the same for two weeks in a row. However, it's worrisome, you know, March has come in like a lamb, so we're already expecting it to go out like a lion. We'll keep you posted, but in the meantime, we're enjoying sunshine and I actually got a little yard work done this week. So I want to share a story, another story from my childhood. I was six years old when this happened, precisely six years old. You see, my parents, uh, my father was going to college, working his way through college out in California, and we lived on the campus right next to the college airport. It was a busy airport. They had a DC-9 parked there that had gotten trapped because it landed and couldn't take off. But every year, the military sent out a pilot to crank up the engine, and they ran the plane down to the end of the drive, the uh, air, the yeah, down to the end of the air airport and <laughs> back, and that was the sum total traffic of that that airport at that time. On the other side of the airport from our house was a um, were was a national forest and every Sabbath my parents would take my brother and I and we would go for a long Sabbath walk. My dad had grown up on a homestead in Oregon and and uh, because of the difficulties that he, my parents had in their childhood teaching us to be independent and, and know, know how to handle ourselves and keep ourselves safe with, was an important thing to them. So they, uh, my dad went out of his way to teach us how to be safe in the woods, you know, recognizing poison ivy, uh, um, <clears throat> knowing that when you turn over rocks and, and, uh, and logs that you, you lift them in such a way that snakes are going to go away from you instead of towards you, things like that. And one day I was five years old and I was really excited about the things that we were, we, I was learning and I said, you know, Dad, I'm getting to be a big boy. I can't wait until I can go out in the woods by myself. When can I do that? And my dad, without a lot of foresight, understand, my dad said, well, you have to be at least six years old to do that. My mom shot daggers at him. And, uh, yeah, they kept quiet about that for the rest of the year. But my sixth birthday, I popped out of bed and I went in, jumped on mom and dad's bed and said, Mom, Dad, I'm six years old today. Today's the day I get to go out in the woods by myself. And... If my dad could have huddled under the covers the rest of the day, I think he would have just to escape the look that my mother was giving him at that moment. But they had a long conversation and in the end, I was allowed to go out in the woods by myself with special instructions not to go further than such and such a point. So I climbed through the fence with my mother watching I went across the airport with my mother watching. I climbed the fence on the other side with my mother watching. I climbed a tree over there on the other side and waved to my mom because she was still watching. And then I went into the woods. Oh, it was an adventure. It was an adventure. I was Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett all rolled into one. And I was having the time of my life and um, I came to this little ledge, well, to me it was a big ledge, and there's a story about Daniel Boone jumping off of a cliff and uh, surviving because he grabbed onto branches on the way down. And I thought, I'm going to be Daniel Boone, and I got all set, and I started running towards the edge of this ledge, and I jumped, and as I jumped, this voice said, Stop! Now, I don't know about your dad, but my dad had trained me that when he said stop, it meant stop now. Uh, and let me tell you, 
I was mid-air, but I stopped. I grabbed onto a branch that was right next to me, and I swung back around on the ledge, and I looked around, and frankly, I was quite upset and disappointed in my father, because I was sure that despite telling me I could go out in the woods by myself, he had followed me. But you know, I couldn't find him. I couldn't find him anywhere. So I thought, he's hiding. Okay, I'm going to tease him. He's teasing me. I'm going to tease him. So I got lined up again, and I got ready to jump. And I went running towards, towards the ledge. And just as I jumped again, the voice said, Stop! And I grabbed onto the branch, and I swung around. Now I was a little confused. Okay? This wasn't like my dad. Usually, he, he, if he was going to prank me, he'd prank me once, and then, and then he'd enjoy it so much that he'd be laughing. But there was no laughter. Just stop. What was I going to do? And then I had a thought. Okay, I will pretend to jump, but I will listen very closely for the direction this, the voice is coming from, and then I'll run over and I'll find him. So I got lined up and I went running and as I got to the edge, I pretended to jump and the voice said, stop. And I immediately went running over to where I had heard the voice and looked behind the trees and looked behind the rocks and went into the bushes and I couldn't find him anywhere. Now I was really puzzled. So I went back over to the ledge, and I was thinking, and I walked up to the edge of the ledge, and I looked down, and you know what I saw? I saw a rattlesnake that was, in my mind as a six-year-old, six feet long. This was a big snake. And it was laying there sunning itself right where I would have landed if I had jumped off that ledge. All of a sudden, it didn't matter to me whether my dad had followed me or not, and I wasn't really concerned about the voice. I just wanted to get home to Mama. I'd had enough being out in the woods by myself. And so I started walking back, and as I walked back, I had to walk past the campus sanitary station. They had some settling ponds out there. And as I walked past the sanitation p ponds, there was a man working there. And just on a whim, as a six-year-old, I went up to this man and I said, Mister, I almost stepped on a big snake out in the woods. Would you come kill it for me? And he kind of looked at me and shook his head and said, where did you come from? And I said, I'm six years old today and my daddy said I could go in the woods by myself, but I can't kill snakes. He got this kind of half smile on his face and he said, sure, sonny. And he picked up his shovel and, and we headed back and we walked back and I led him to the, that ledge and he looked down and he said, That's a big snake, Sonny. And he went down there and he killed that big snake. Well, I made it home safely at that point. And um, my mom asked me if I'd had fun, and I told her yes, and I told her all about the snake. And she looked at me, because I'd been telling her about how I'd been, been playing Daniel Boone and J.V. Crockett and all the adventures I'd been on as Daniel Boone, and she said, is this a real story or a pretend story? I said, no, Mom, this is a real story. There was a real snake. But she had this, that skeptical look that moms get when they're not quite sure whether their son is imagining or reporting. So my dad came home and 
they talked and he grilled me and said, that's a really nice story, Steve. I'm really glad you had that adventure. But I knew they really didn't believe me and it, it was kind of frustrating to me, but what can I do? How could I prove to them that there had been a snake, that there had been a voice? Well, I told you we lived on campus and this was a church college and so when Sabbath came, instead of driving to church, we just walked to church. It saved money and believe me, my parents were all about saving money because he was working his way through college. So we're walking to church and all of a sudden this pickup pulls up next to us and I look up and it's the man. It's the man who was working at the sanitation ponds, the man who killed the snake. And he looked over at my dad and he said, Hey, Scotty. I didn't, I didn't know they knew each other, but evidently they knew each other. He said, Hey, Scotty, that was some snake your son had me kill for him the other day. And I could see my mom's eyes go boom. And my dad looked at me. Boom! And I smiled because I had found my evidence, my proof. Somebody else had seen my snake. So what do you do with a story like this? There was nobody around, and yet a voice told me to stop. What has this story meant to me in my life? Well, I can tell you as a child, based on what I had been taught, I immediately concluded that that voice was my guardian angel. And all of a sudden, stories about guardian angels became very real to me. My experience suggested that guardian angels were not imaginary. They weren't like Santa Claus. I had an angel who was with me all the time who cared about me, who was trying to protect me. Of course, that meant I had an angel with me all the time, and that meant I didn't just have to be careful about what I did and said around mom and dad, because my angel was watching. And you know, guardian angels are also recording angels, and yeah, so this story in my childhood both gave me a sense of specialness and being protected and being cared for, but also a sense of accountability that I had never had before. My angel was watching. When I was a young adult and I started struggling with agnosticism, not sure what I could believe or not believe in, this story became problematic for me. You said, see, the evidence that I got, got from my culture and from, from education and from, from the smart people that I associated with all pointed me down the path towards God's an invention of mankind. We need that security blanket when we are unsophisticated, primitive, unintelligent people, but we rational people, we smart people, we don't need God because God's just an invention of people. But then I came back to the snake and the voice and I couldn't go down the path of a materialistic universe where there's nothing that can't be seen and touched and controlled and understood by men. For me, this was just a struggle, a conundrum, a paradox, because my rational, rational uh, self wanted to go down this pathway, but my experience said, no, that, that pathway's incomplete. There's, there's things that aren't being addressed there. It came to a head once when one of my friends, my fellow travelers, somebody I really loved and respected, came to me and said, Steve, we need to talk about that snake story of yours. We need to figure out how to help you get past
past that snake story. That phrasing just caught my attention. Get past that snake story. Why would I want to get past it? Why would I want to get past my experience? Unless I was trying to invalidate my experience so that I could believe something that my experience said was unbelievable. And believe it or not, that question was seminal in my life. It pointed me back towards faith because if the people that I was traveling with, my peers, the ones I respected, were trying to ignore experience for the sake of believing something, I wasn't sure that was who I wanted to be. Now, those of you who are Christians find it very believable that an angel spoke to me and protected me. It fits with your system of belief, the, the, the facts, the Bible that you accept as defining belief, maybe even your experience. Those of you who are, aren't Christian or haven't had experiences like this may find it a little more difficult. In fact, you may find it unbelievable. That's okay. I'm not trying to persuade you here. I'm sharing what's happened to me. But what this story means to me today Well, between Fairfield, where I live, and the next county seat to the east, Albion, there's a hill that you go up, and <clears throat> along the road, in the cut up the hill, there are these huge, flat boulders of sandstone, just stacked like, <laughs> like pancakes along the road. I mean, it's so unusual. We don't have rocks in southern Illinois. We have pebbles and sand, okay? But to get rocks, you have to go two hours south, well, an hour and a half south to Shawnee Hills or way north uh, to um, areas in Indiana. Here in this part of Illinois, all we have is cold mud. I've told you that before. But there are these rocks sitting on top of the ground. Well, it's because when they were building the road, they hit bedrock. And they had to remove these slabs of bedrock in order to get the road bed level and stable. That's what this story is for me. It's a fragment of bedrock that became visible in my life. that gives me certainty about the invisible foundations of my beliefs, my worldview, what I take to be true. Have you had experiences like this? I'd be interested in hearing them. If you haven't had experiences like this, then you have a choice. You see, every one of us, when we hear the experiences of other people, we have a choice of whether to accept that as our own experience vicariously or to reject it, to hold ourselves aloof. Last week, I shared the story of my Abba experience, and I offered a rope to you if you're dealing with depression darkness and offered you the choice of accepting it or not. This week I'm at offering you another experience of mine. One that was used to help me to find faith in the face of disbelief. If you find yourself struggling, you have a choice again. You can accept. I'm not asking you to take it for proof. But accept this experience as a rope. Hold on to it.
Because if this experience is real, and if there is a God who cares about you, if you're holding on to this rope, he's going to do something more to pull you home. Have a wonderful day, friends. Be safe. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.